have your Bible, uh, you can open your Bible to the book of Job and the book of Acts, chapter 17. The book of Job. Let me look and see if I can find where I want you to go with me to the book of Job. I think I can find it. Yeah. Job chapter 31. If you'll find that, I want to uh, kind of continue a little on the same thing that we were on last Sunday. But I want you to look with me at this passage of Scripture in Job chapter 31. This is the closest place that I can find this phrase that we are all familiar with that is not in the Bible. You know, and a lot of people embrace a lot of things that are not in the Bible that they would swear is in the Bible and it's not, should be. Yep. Yeah, Job chapter 31 and Acts chapter 17. Find those two places. I want to read from these places. Job 31. Uh, have y'all ever heard that verse of Scripture that God, the cleanliness is next to godliness? Mm -hmm. No. And that's not in the Bible. No. <laughs> <laughs> But it should be. <laughs> it's not, but it should be. Well, this is another one. Have you ever heard that? You have been you have been weighed and found in the balance wanting. Have you ever heard of that mm -hmm. verse of scripture? It's not in the Bible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a really good sounding verse of scripture that doesn't exist. But it sounds good, especially in the idea of Christian condemnation and judgment. I mean, it, that, I mean, it's so justifiable. And that's what I was talking about with this movie. If you get a chance to watch this movie, uh, what did I tell you the name? Amish. Amish Grace. If you get a chance to watch that movie, it's one of the most profound movies I have ever seen. Actually, it is probably the most profound message I've ever heard on forgiveness. I mean, I could, I could not weep enough watching that movie. I just cried and cried and cried because it, it just totally touched me in such a way yes. about things that I knew, things I already know, yeah. but many things we want some sort of justification, bless God, if, if, especially if the crime is horrendous. You know, in that in this particular case, it is a true story of a young man that went into an Amish community and uh, took all the girls in a classroom, I think 10 girls in that classroom, and took a gun in there with him with the purpose of killing all of these girls because he had a daughter. He already had two sons, and his wife gave birth to a daughter, and she did not live an entire day. So he was mad at God for taking his daughter. So to get back at God, that was how... He wanted to do that. So he actually went in there. And you you know, you have to really think, how can you justify forgiveness for that? Killing these young girls, Amish girls that were innocent as they could. Anyway, gosh, it's one of the most profound movies I've ever seen. And it always deals, and you'll see it if you get to watch it, you'll see what I'm talking about, because I promise you it'll touch you the same way it did me, because you watch the movie and somehow or another, in in your and my on judgmental minds, we feel that justice has to be served, period. And we see that, but we do not see it through the eyes of forgiveness and the eyes of God, the way this movie will portray it. And I'm sure that a lot of people wouldn't agree with it, but I don't see how they could not. It's a beautiful movie. Anyway, Job chapter 31, look at this, verse 6. It says, let me, this is what Job said, Job this is again, and I say this so much when I'm talking about the book of Job. Most people haven't got a clue about the book of Job because they haven't read the beginning and the end. And if you've got to read the end, then you begin to get a little bit more understanding about what the book of Job is about, or at least some understanding. And that understanding is what, guy, what the guys that Job is dialoguing says that God would do is not what God would do. But in our mind of thinking, especially our judgmental mind of thinking, it does sound like God would do that, or God should do that, like God would be obligated to do certain things if justice is to be served. And so this is what 
Job says to his friends, he says, let, let me be weighed in all uh, in, and let me be weighed in an even balance that God may know my integrity. Let me be weighed in an even. And now I want you to kind of see that in an even balance. And so go with me now to the book of of Acts chapter 17. This is a passage of scripture that we used last week and I want to bring it back. I want to use it again this week in uh, what it says. And we're going to come back to being weighed in an even balance. And what, do, what does that really mean? What does that, how do we see that? And uh, I, I think that you'll see it with me. I'm pretty sure you will. Uh, Acts chapter 17 and verse 28, Paul is quoting something. And many times, if you read this, you don't think Paul is quoting this. If you read this by what it says, you'll think this is something that Paul is inspired to say. And so we take inspiration to be something that God inspires you to do that somebody else didn't say or if you are quoting somebody else that said that and you're saying no God inspired me to say that and it's come off the cuff which is generally not the case generally it's something like this Paul's quoting this Paul is quoting from a Greek philosopher and most people don't know that hmm. but if if we would do a little bit of homework or a little bit of research then we could find out these things. Because look at this verse. It says in verse 28, For in Him we live, we move, and we have our being. Now, that's a common phrase in Christianity. And most everybody is going to say the Him yes. in this passage is either Jesus or God. It's either one of the two. Or both of the two, being Jesus wow as God in the flesh and the only representative of God in the flesh being Jesus. Now that's how people would, would say that and read that passage but notice what it says again look at it verse in him we live we move and we have our being as certain also of our poets have said. In other words Paul said I'm quoting this from a poet or a philosopher and you can you can Anybody can probably Google it and you can find the do some research and you'll find that actually this guy's name was Aratus. A-R-A-T-U-S. Aratus. And he lived, he was a Greek philosopher and, now I want you to hear this, he was also a Greek philosopher, poet, astrologer. And so the things that he said in his poetry and in his philosophy was drawn from Greek astrology. Greek mythology and Greek mythology for instance if you study the the mythology of Hercules and his 12 labors you will find that one of the requirements of Hercules or as Hercules begins the story of his mythology was that he has to clean out the stables where the animals were and if you look at the story of Jesus he was born in the stable where the animals were and there is a correlation to both of those stories and that just simply is that man is born as an animal with a divine essence or he's born in a stall just like an animal is born. So that's the idea behind that mythology but that mythology is even though you're born that way you don't have to be that way. And the whole idea behind that is with Hercules is his 12 labors. Jesus is his 12 apostles or 12 disciples. Similar stories and tell a lot about the same thing, which are the stories of us, all of us. And many times we don't know that because we've just never been told or we've never been taught. And so we get stuck with the religious ideas that are given to us and we embrace those ideas as though they were true or the bottom line of truth and they may have some truth in them with a whole lot of mixture and many times we don't recognize the mixture as we should so I wanted to read this note I wrote and uh, put this in your thinking uh, we and 
when I'm using this phrase, we, I'm referring to myself and all of humanity that's involved in Christianity. We, parentheses, humanity, especially Western, Roman Christianity, whether it be Catholic or Protestant, probably could be more accurate to say Catholic or uh, the Church of England because Protestantism actually comes out of the Church of England. And what really began to divide the Church of England was the uh, all of the wars. If any of you have ever read Paul Bunyan's Holy Wars, you'll find that the wars that went on in England was not just the wars between the Church of England and the Roman Church. It was between the Church of England and all of the other branches that split off from that. The, uh, the Puritan churches, the Presbyterian churches that all split off of uh, uh, the German church. What was the German guy's name? Luther. When Luther mailed his thesis to the door, it created havoc like we cannot even imagine. And some of the cities, the, the blood literally run in the streets where they were fighting each other. Not just of their break away from <coughs> Catholicism. Oh yeah, they were fighting that. But they were fighting their ideas among each other. So the Protestant church was just fighting itself, killing those who wanted to be Lutherans as opposed to those who wanted to be Presbyterians, as opposed to those who wanted to be Puritans, as opposed to those who were the Church of England. And that still is a pretty strong thing even to this very day. But, but we don't recognize it. We don't know it. Why? Because we are so lost over here in America, the Western, the extreme Western side of this thing, not knowing that all of these ideas are still inside us. Well, right here in the ministerial group that kind of told you to go. Told away, me not to come back. <laughs> we were we were sponsoring Mark Rutland, a former Methodist minister turned Pentecostal, and the two big Church of God pastors stood up and said, because there was some talk about, can we listen to the Baptists and everything? No, if they don't speak in tongues, we don't want them. Well, see, what started that off, I was a part of the ministerial association here up until that point in time, but I had a really close friend of mine who was a Baptist minister who had, mm -hmm. who had experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit and had took his church, that was Green Street Baptist Church, and changed the name of it to the Temple of the Lord and dropped the Baptist Umbrella, and so he wanted to be involved in this meeting that yep. Steve is talking about, and so I was involved in this too because I knew Mark Rutland, and I was a part of wanting to bring him here to this area. It was a, it was supposed to be a joint effort from all, all the churches, and that's what they. And so I stood up for. I was actually standing up for for David Gray. That was. Uh, but the two big power, the, the, the money bunch, they said no, we won't help sponsor. Right, and so it, they got their way. They, so they asked me not to come back. Said, okay. He didn't come back and they got their way. It was just a Pentecostal. So I, I want you to really think about what I'm saying because and I realize, you know, these CDs, if this CD happens to go out, it goes out to a, it has a life of its own. It just goes out and God knows who we're going to wind up. It may be in a truck stop somewhere and, and it does. But, uh, uh, you know, I, my whole heart's cry is that people would start to think and forget their their beliefs that keep them from thinking. And if, you, if this causes you to think outside your box or your belief system, then so be it. Give it some thought. You know what I'm saying? Just, just entertain it for just a little while. You might find something in it that's really juicy or good for you. So we humanity, especially the Western Roman Christian, Christian Christianity, whether it be Catholic or Protestant, we have been so deceived by the translations of the Western Church and especially the King James Version of the Bible. I mean, in the South, especially in this whole area, when I'm talking about the South, I'm talking about Tennessee, North South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, this whole area around here that's predominantly Baptist, it's the King James Version and the King James only. We even have churches that have the marquee at their own. In, in this area, this county, that says King James Version only. In other words, if it ain't the King James Bible, it ain't the Bible. Even in Baptist church, it's out there on their side. It's amazing how that people could be not only that dogmatic, but that ignorant to, to embrace such a 
an idea like that and not think outside of that. But anyway, most likely more than 80% of the Western Roman Church would be offended by this statement simply because we have believed the stories we have been told without asking questions such as, and I'm just giving a few of the stories that are given to us out of the Bible without a question being asked. And all we are told is just simply, just trust it, just believe it. That's all they're actually asking. Just believe the story that it is the way. And that is a talking snake. There's never been a talking snake. There's, there's never ever been a record of a talking snake except in the Bible. And of course, I explained that a little bit last week. If we were to go back and just do the study on what the serpent represented or the dragon, always you could interchange those two, serpent or dragon, and they always refer to the power or the galaxy or the energy of the astrological wheel and how the serpent eats its tail. Or in other words, it's how life swallows up death to reproduce life. It's, a, it's an unending perennial philosophy. And so that's what the serpent represented. So in Genesis chapter 3, that's what the serpent represents is that, that uh, unending or that, uh, well, we would call it reincarnation now or it continues to go on. The talking snake, that's one story we're told just to accept. The apple tree, that's another story. The woman ate the apple from the tree in the garden. And that's another story that we're told. None of these stories don't exist there, but yet we're told they do. We're told to believe these stories, and for the most part, people really do. So we in humanity have had men and women for hundreds and even thousands of years who have researched and studied these and all the other stories, tales, allegories, myths, or whatever they are called, only to find out that that is exactly what they are. They are stories. They're myths. They're tales. Uh, they're allegories. And they are phenomenal. They're fabulous, but they're not literal. <laughs> so a snake don't talk. An apple tree don't curse. It don't give you something bad. And those are stories. And what we got to do is extract the truth out of these stories, not believe them or make them literal. They're fabulous stories told about humankind and its relationship to its creator. We have a statement by Paul that we are just reading now in Acts 17. In him we live, we move, and we have our being. This statement, if heard by most all Christians, will think that in him is either referring to Jesus or it is referring to God. And I would suggest that it does and it doesn't. That's, well, that's a contradiction. Of course it is. Truth is hell in a paradox. Truth is positive and negative. It's not just either or, it's both and. And that's so hard for us to embrace. How could anything be both and? Well, God is. God is both human and not. God is both divine and not. God is both heavenly and earthly. So, you know, it shouldn't be so difficult for us to ask these questions and at least uh, entertain the idea of them. So go back with me to John chapter 1. I think this verse in John helps me to validate this as much if not more than anything that we could read in the Bible, but let's just look at it, follow me through it, uh, something that we have done here many times, but uh, repetition is the teacher for me, so I hope it does for you. John, John chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning is the Word, the Word is with God, and the Word is God. The same is in the beginning with God. In other words, the Word. In other words, God. Verse 3, all things are made by Him. Now, and all of a sudden, here we have the in Him that we're talking about, and who would the Him be? Well, it would be the Word, and it would be God. Right? I think that's, I don't see how that could be argued, but I think that's pretty clear. The Him here is God 
are the Word. The Word, of course, is the Logos, and we really get into Greek mythology on the Logos, we begin to realize the Logos is the astrological wheel and its power of emanation or its power of creation or its power to create. And it does that through vibration. That's what the word is. Every word is a vibration. Just exactly like music is a vibration. Just exactly like color is a vibration. And so therefore we go right back to the seven stick man that we use here so often or the seven days of Genesis 1 and 2, or, 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 seven golden candlesticks, and you can just go on and on and on, and we realize that that is the astrological wheel. It's the seven and the twelve. It's the, which we will look at that and we'll see that. So verse 3, all things were made by Him. Now if you want to put that Him as Jesus, that's fine if you really do understand the story of Jesus as, as much as you could understand the story of Hercules or as much as you could go to Egypt and understand the story of Horus. Because it's the same story. And the truth of the matter is, it's your story. But it's hard for us to embrace it and on it and say it's my story as much as it is his story. But... It's so clear if we would just open our eyes and we go back into the scriptures and we read and we realize that whatever he did, I have to do. Whatever he is, I am. <laughs> I mean, and those are scriptures I'm just quoting. So, verse 3, all things were made by him. In other words, word, logos, vibration, God, Elohim, etc. There's nothing made without him was not anything made that is made in him is life and the life is the light of men and the light shined in the darkness or in matter but the matter uh, comprehended it not or couldn't stop it couldn't do anything with it verse 12 but as many as receive him this vibration or energy to them it, he, he to them gave he power I could read it this way, to them he empowers them to be the sons of God. Or to be the mind, to be the same mind as God. So go with me now to the book of Galatians. Let's just see what something that Paul says here. And I think this will help the mixture, the ingredient, so that we can quit arguing with our own minds or quit arguing with religion or, or quit arguing with, <laughs> with me, if that be the case. <laughs> Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. Verse 15 says, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal... Watch this verse right here. This is a very, very powerful statement by Paul. To reveal His Son where? In me. Where? In me. In me. Where is His Son? Now you want to say that's Jesus. That's fine. You want to say that's Christ. That's fine. You want to say that's God. That's fine. But what is it? And again, I would go right back to the astrological wheel. I go right back to my cross that I put on the board so, so many times. Uh, which you might as well put it up here because we have, and when it's talking about revealing this in him, revealing God's Son in him or in you or in me. This would be my my cross. This colored one. I put the colored one up here because these are my. That's my my dates. February, uh, May the twenty first, the day that my father released the seed and created me. It's the day that God empowered my father to release that seed. It's the day that God, by spirit and by soul come into my mother's womb with the knowledge, with the creative power. I mean, 
you know, that should settle the issue. Anybody, anybody would like to argue with that. I can't even imagine how anybody would want to argue with that. It's in that seed. That's exactly what it's talking about in John 1.1. 1, 1. The Word, what is the Word? The Word is a seed. And what is the seed? It's the creative power to do the work that God designed it to do. And so that's when Dad released his seed nine months later. Mother pushed me out and I breathed Ruach February the 19th. February the 19th, I incubated for nine months in the womb. Mother pushed me out and boom, I was born. It's true with you wherever you fit on this astrological wheel. That would be your cross. Everybody's cross is different, but nevertheless, that would be your cross. That would be the time. Now watch what Paul says here. To reveal his son in me that I might preach him. There we go with that him again. Whatever this him is, and I want you to see this him to be, this H-I-M, to be the power of God. You, you and I can call it the Son of God, but what is the Son of God? But it, it's God, Christ, Messiah, Horus, if I'm using Egyptian mythology, all of those in me as me. And that's what Paul is saying. I'm revealing his son in me. And he didn't, you know, he didn't, uh, it's a powerful verse, he did not mix it up. It sounds pretty clear that I might preach him among the nations, a uh, heathens, he says heathens, but it, might, it means nations. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Hallelujah. Look what he said. He said, Neither went I to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia. I mean, he didn't even go down to the Holy Land. He didn't even go to the Holy City. He didn't even go to Rome. He, he took <laughs> off to Arabia. You know, uh, I think that's where Hidalgo went, wasn't it? To ride that horse. <laughs> <laughs> so he went over there and he didn't confer with anybody. Why? He's, he's getting this information. He's understanding this. And the thing that we fail to recognize is that all of this is rooted and based in astrology. And if we, as and when we do figure that out, then, uh, you know, I think that we'll be, we'll be the much better off. We'll begin to see things clearer. I know we will. All right, go with me to another verse of Scripture. In Philippians, just turn over a few pages. Galatians, Ephesians, and then you will come right there to Philippians. Look at Philippians chapter 2. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that you may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of the others. Let this mind be in you, this mind be in you, which is also in Christ. And of course the translators add Jesus there. And that's fine. It doesn't matter if they do or if they don't. If we, rec we recognize that Jesus is the representative of man. What did Jesus say that he was? He said, I am the son of man. He never ever said, you won't find anywhere in the four gospels Jesus called himself the son of God. He never did. He always called himself the son of man. Why? He represents mankind. Just exactly like the story of Adam in the Old Testament represents mankind or humankind. Not just man, not just the male species, but male and female. He's representing mankind. So if we could recognize that in that ad addition, that's, that, then we would realize what is the Christ in Jesus? It's the same Christ in you. There's no difference of the Christ. The Christ is the Him. It's the anointing. It's the oil. It's the oil of life that's in your body. It actually is also called a tree of life that's in your body. And every one of us have that. You're born with it. It, it comes. It comes with the seed of my Father. It comes with the seed of your Father to create you and to build you 
in the womb of your mother. It's the same thing. So he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, who being in the form of God, would that be you also? No, we think it was just Jesus. Yeah. We don't realize it. I am in the form of God. Who built me? Who formed me? Who constructed me in the womb of my mother without a hammer and a saw? God did that. There's no intelligence in man to do that. Man can't figure that out. That just simply is. God built that. God formed you. You are the form of God. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. We should not think it robbery to be equal with God. We are the child of God. We're the offspring of God. We're built by God. By God. <laughs> I mean, you know, that should be... That should not be so difficult. Verse 7, but made himself of no reputation. It took upon him, here we go this him again, the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man and being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even to the death, the death of the cross. We see all of that as the cross being a wooden thing Jesus was attached to or, or in other words, we call this the cardinal cross. But the cardinal cross is where the Adam Kid Mon is hung. The Adam Kid Mon is the God man in the sky in astrology. You and I are hung. I'm hung on this cross. That's my cross. John, Jesus said in John, for me to take up my cross. This is my cross that God hung me on to create me. Makes me unique and different, just like your cross makes you unique and different. With the DNA of your father, the DNA of your mother. Being being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the death. The death just simply means the sleep of the material existence. That's all. It, and you're only asleep to wake up. We're not put here to sleep for 60, 70, 80, or 100, and 150 years. We're put here asleep to wake up. That's our whole, our whole work in life is to wake up. And a, a thing about it is sometimes waking is not easy. Sometimes shaking ourselves from the uh, the addictions of the physical body is a lifelong work, and it's not necessarily a, a necessarily an easy work. It's not even necessarily an easy task, but it is a work that we can do. The Greek word Christ is not what the Roman Church or the Church of England, or the Protestant Church wants you and I to think it is. It comes from the ancient Greek uh, that was used hundreds of years before Jesus. Everybody associates, everybody, I'm talking about Christians, most all Christians associate the word Christ as a name of Jesus. They call Him Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus, just like I'm Harold Lynn, Hayes, Jesus Christ, that Christ is, is not His name. The Christos of the Greek was not a name designated to an individual or to a person. The Christos in the Greek was a holy oil. And that holy oil is in your body, in my body, in every human being alive. It's in their body. That holy oil is the substance of life. And you have it, I have it, everyone has it. And this is exactly what Paul is talking about here in this passage of Scripture when he talks about the Christos. All you have to do is look up the word Christ. Christos, that's exactly what it is in the Greek. And so when, uh, when I refer to this character, uh, let me uh, see if I could put this character in here. Uh, Draw a picture of him right here. baby's head. You can see that clearly. And this is his arms. That's his chest area, heart, etc. And that's his little belly and 
Here would be his pelvic. And from his pelvic, he has uh, two legs that extend outwardly. Okay. And that would be these two legs. So his feet in the astrological wheel. This little character is called the Adam Kid Mon. Or you can see this is the baby in the womb of its mother. Or if you really get out of the box, you'll begin to say this is the creative energy of the Elohim to create the physical body, to create all the organs in the body, to create the whole body as a complete whole unit. So you can see that very clearly. This is where the feet are under the head. There's a passage of scripture in Genesis that talks about the feet being under the head. It's referring to this chart right here. And this is the Adam Kidmon, or we'll call him the God man in the sky. That's how ancient Hebrew refers to it. And we're going to look at some things about this, this, this little guy in just a couple of minutes and see some. Uh, there's a more, there's a lot more beautiful detail in this story that I want to bring out this morning. And, uh, and this is the hymn. When he's talking about the hymn, this is the hymn that it's referring to. So, um, go with me if you would now. We're, we're in Philippians. Go over one place to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and look at verse 17. Colossians 1, 17. And look what it says. And he, this he is him. Again, we want to see what the he and the him is. And he is before all things and by him. Him is he and he is him. And by him all things consist. Now, if I'm talking about he and I'm talking about him, here's the he and here's the him I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Admon, Kidmon, or I'm talking about the God man in the sky, or I'm talking about the astrological wheel because there are not many people who can look at the astrological wheel and see a human being. But it tells you real clearly in all of ancient material, as above, so below, as without, so within. That's the ancient hermetic phrase. So everything you are is out there. In other words, the sun, the moon, the, the stars, and the planets. That everything out there creates everything in here. It creates this here. So the hymn that everything's referring to is the hymn out there that creates the everything in here. I, I mean, is that, that, is that okay? Everybody can see that? Verse 17. Yep. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist, or all things are held together. Verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. Again, here's the hymn. Everybody's associated it to Jesus. That's fine if you associate it to Jesus. Associate it to Jesus as Jesus being your brother or Jesus being a part of the human race or Jesus being a part of you and me. And that's hard. That's extremely hard. Why? Because we've been told that He's the only begotten of the Father. Not realizing that you and I are the monogenesis. Monogenesis. Same identical word, monogenesis. Just simply means that we have all been begotten by the one source only. What source is that? It's the Him in the sky. It's the Elohim. It's the astrological wheel. It's the powers of God to create. Because it's, it's, called, it's all it does. It constantly creates it. It's creating you and me. Now go with me to a passage of Scripture in Revelations. I want you to see this because I'm going to read you some things here in just a second about by Alan Boyd Coon that will really blow you away. Where are we now? Revelations chapter 11. Yeah, just go to Revelations 11. I want to read this. And... Uh, you can kind of put this in your pipe and smoke it because uh, it's sometimes it's difficult to grasp this. Okay. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 8. And he says in verse 8, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. Where? Does your translation say that? 
Egypt? Was, was he, he crucified in Egypt? That's what it says. It says he was crucified in Egypt. Hmm. Now why would they do that? You see, we have, we have failed to recognize the symbol or the type or the myth behind Egypt and all the Egyptian mythology. Egypt actually being a lower country on the lower part of the hemisphere of the earth is referring to the flesh, always refers to the physical. So the nation of Egypt always referred to the physical body. In all mythology, it referred to the physical body. The physical body is not wrong. The physical body is a divine vehicle created by God. For what purpose? For the purpose of God. So that God, through the physical body, can be glorified in the earth realm. That's the whole, that was the, one of the whole purposes behind God creating the physical body. I want to read you something that Alvin Boyd Coon wrote here in a little book that he calls Through Science to Religion. Just a little small pamphlet that he wrote. He said, perhaps it is now to be realized with something of a shock to our present pride of superior knowledge that we have not yet caught what is the central fact of all religion, philosophy, and anthropology, that man's soul in his body on precisely the, are on precisely the same terms analogically considered as is a seed in the ground. I would say sila to that. Man's soul in his body is as a seed in the ground. And what does that seed do in the ground? We say it dies. It really metamorphoses itself. It don't die. It really changes itself. It transposes itself. Well, what is that soul supposed to be and do inside you and me? The same identical thing. It takes the carnal and turns it into the divine. It takes the normal and turns it into the abnormal. It takes that which is not and turns it into that which is. That which is designed to be. Apparently we have not yet weight to the fact that the religion of the seed or the plant to its soil is a perfect an analog or paralog of the entire relation of man divine to man human. Of soul to flesh, of spirit to matter. It is entirely likely that the present series will demonstrate, will demonstrate it on every page that the corn myth of ancient time is the lost key of the scientific understanding of all Bibles, of all religions, hab habitudes of mankind, and all ritualism, worship, theology, priestcraft, and ecclesiastic ecclesiasticism in the life of man. Yeah. The Egyptians did not worship animals, stars, trees, nature in any part, but they did utilize all of these in their worship because they were seen to be photographs of living truth. Dear God, if we could just get that and realize we're not worshiping the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the planets, and all of that, or the trees, and the animals, and this, we're just using them as pictures pictographs as he said the pictures to show me me so that I can begin to see who that I really am they if we can utilize these as the living truth there therefore they had in their hands an endless book of cosmographs which needed only to be looked at with the lens of a mind that could so to say restore the original cosmic focus or lift the concrete physical representations back to the level of its nominal counterpart. Uh, you know, his work is just, to me, just beautiful, phenomenal. I want to read something else to you here, kind of in closing. Uh, another book uh, that he wrote, this book right here is his magnum opus. Uh, it's called The Lost Light, written in 1940. And 
and it is stated by the Ohio University to be the most profound thesis of theology ever put forth in the English language. And that's recorded in, in the University of Ohio. That's, that's to be one of the most profound pieces of English literature ever written. And I have to agree with it. I have to say it is. And, and you know, it's not something you sit down and read. You can't. You sit down and read. You can't sit down and read this book. This book. This book's around six hundred pages. It, it, it just, it's just profound, the things that he brings out, the research that's gone into this. And, you know, if I was anybody and I wanted to try to debunk Alvin Boyd Coon, then I would put myself to the test of study and try to figure out if he's saying the truth or if he's telling a lie. But if he's saying some things that are true that we forgot for a couple of hundred or maybe even 17 or 1800 years, it might do well for us to, to really research it and dig into it and see what he's saying. So let me... Uh, let's see here. Where do I want to start reading right here? Thoth, who is the attorney, he's using this. Let me see if I want to read that or this first. Yeah, let me go ahead and read this first. Thoth, who is an attorney. Most people are not going to understand these names, especially Christians. They're not familiar with these terms unless you've read the Egyptian Book of the Dead or a lot of the other material about uh, Egypt. Thoth, Thor, Hermes are all the same character. They go by different names. And the story of Thoth or the story of Thor, I think there's a movie come out quite a few years ago about Thor, which is a depiction of this ancient character and Thor, of course, was depicted as a most powerful uh, person with his anvil, the power of his anvil. But he is also a picture of you and me. The story of Thoth, Thor, or Hermes is listed under what's called the Hermetic philosophies. Uh, masonry, masonry is built on this whole concept. Christianity is built on this whole concept and don't even know it. They don't even realize that that's what it is. Thoth, who is attorney at the trial in Amenti, is entitled the Lord of the Balance. Now re remember I read that to you from Job right at the very beginning about balance. Thoth, who is an attorney at the trial of Amenti, is entitled Lord of the Balance. Let me explain this to you so that you will get the grasp of what I'm talking about right here. It's called the Lord of the Balance. Let's just put the stick man up here. And of course, this stick man is you. Alright. This is you. And, uh, it, it looks really good when I when I do this in color. If I'm talking about the Lord of Balance, and I want you to pay attention to this, if you look at any medical uh, book about your brain, you would see that in your upper brain you have a left and right hemisphere, and part of our work is to balance our left and right hemisphere, which we we never. Uh, we never even try to do that. We're never taught to do that. You know, there are different ways to try to balance your left and right hemisphere. Trying to balance your left and right hemisphere is your male and your female hemisphere. And every man has a male and female brain. Every woman has a male and female brain. We never try to balance that. So if I'm a female and I'm trying to balance the male side of my brain, that's not going to make me a man. <laughs> It's going to cause me to, to think from a balanced perspective. But I, I don't do that. Why? I'm never trained to do that. And what I'm about to read you about Egyptian mythology, because they study the, the astrological wheel, sun, moon, stars, planets, and so and they study animals, and they study plants, etc., etc., 
But they didn't study them to worship them. They studied them to get truth from them, to extract the truth. But we don't do that. Why? Because we have been told that the only truth we've got is the King James Version of the Bible, and we've lost trying to read it. Nobody comes up with the same idea. It's so divided, so divisive. So you have a left and a right hemisphere of your brain, which would be this side. This would be March. This, your head, is the same thing as this, your head. This is Aries. Aries the realm, right here. And as the realm, the realm, as the, the symbol of it is, is that. That's the symbol of Aries. Why? Because it's the symbol of the left and the right brain. I mean, the realm, the horns come out of where? They're coming out of the left and the right side. So the lamb that was slain, or the ram in, caught in the bush, is referring to your brain. Now, if we, under, if we can come to a place to understand what balance is, we will, we will come closer to realize this, this bar, or this line across through here, represents the horizon. The horizon represents balance. Why? Not only does it represent March, the 21st, which has 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night, or in other words, the day balances. It's equal. And over here in Libra, or September, the 21st, Libra, again, is we call it the scales of justice. It should never have been called that. It should have been called the scales of balance. Why? Because it represents the pelvic bone. You have a left and right pelvic bone. The women have a left and right ovary. The men have a left and right testicle. This is a creative aspect in your lower ab abdomen as well as this is a creative aspect in your upper abdomen. And our whole work is to balance this which is above the brain to this which is below the sex organs or the pelvic bone. We're to balance these so that we can walk the straight and narrow path. The mythology behind this, the stories behind this are so profound and so powerful once we open our minds out of this box of religion that we have been locked up into. That's why this horizon is called a balance beam. So on September the 21st, you have 12 hours a day and 12, 12 hours of night. In other words, a balance, a balanced day. So you're to balance this and you're to balance this. The scales of justice. The pelvic and the brain. Not just one. You're not just going to balance the brain. You know, you're going to get all this up here right and never get this down here right. You're going to get your walk right and never get your thinking and your talk right. It don't work. you got to get on both ends. you got to balance on both ends. you got a seed that comes out of this one up here. And how do you use that seed? By the phallic of your tongue. You spew the seeds out right here. Well, how do you use this seed down here? By the egg or by the seed? Both are created. This up here, the head, the tongue, and this down here, the sex organs, both are created. Both have that ability. They're both divine. As God is a creator, so are we. So are you. So am I. So here, he, let me read this to you again. Thoth, who is the attorney at the trial of Amenti, is, in, is entitled the Lord of the Balance. Thoth, or Thoth, embodies the power symbolized by the Thoth cross. The Thoth, T-A-T, or T-A-U, cross. The Thoth cross. Look at this. You... You go to Egypt, you pull it up on Egypt, this is called the Ankh. Or it's called the Ta. Or it's called the Tot. It's called the Ta, cross, or the Tot. You go and look at any Egyptian work. Look at any of the walls and you will see this symbol, the Ankh, everywhere. And people wonder, what is it about? And they always say that it's about eternal life. That's what they, that's what they say the Egyptians were referred to when they talk about eternal life. This ta, look at this, 
This ark and this picture right here are exactly the same thing. The only difference is they have moved the cross down here from the equator with the saltist below it with the astrological wheel in balance between it. So what is the ark about? It's about balance. Again, it's about the same thing. I have to balance my talk and I have to balance my walk. I have got to bring balance in both aspects of my life. And so when you read the Egyptian mythology, you're going to just, this is just repeated over and over and over and over and over again. So let me read a little bit further here. Thoth or Toth embodies the power symbolized by the Toth cross of Egypt, which was the emblem of eternal stability. Well, what do you think we're reading about right here when, it's, when it says where our Lord was crucified in Egypt? They are referring to this. This man or woman, this Adam Kidmon, being crucified just simply means the death of the cross or it's referring to the sleep of the physical body. It's saying the same thing either way you want to look at it, either way you want to cut it. So he says from Egypt, which was the emblem of eternal stability and the power that raised up life which had fallen under the sway of matter. He therefore presides at the horizontal balance where the soul and matter are in, in conflict. In other words, He is the divinity within us. Mm -mm -mm. Thoth is the divinity that lifts us up when falling under the seductions of the senses. Thoth is he who, when the eye of Ra is sick and when it weeps for its fellow eye, then Thoth stands up to cleanse it. In other words, again, going back, if that eye is single or if that eye is weeping or if that eye is, is dirty, it's the cleansing of the, of the, what, the single eye to see that I am what God designed and built me to be. You are, I am. So when we begin to read these stories by Paul or anybody else goes to talking about him, he's talking about you and me as a creative uh, representative. He's talking about the Adam Kid Bond as you and me. So if you can associate yourself with him in the Bible, then you realize that he and he and you are one, and that, and, and you know, as we begin to entertain that, we begin to to draw on that, we begin to realize that ever what he did, I can do. Does that mean supernatural? Uh, yes, I I really think it means supernatural. In our way of thinking, we think, well, it means to walk through a wall. Well, if that be necessary, so be it. Walk through a wall. Yeah. Make sure you're at the place where you can go to the other side. <laughs> or maybe you wind, wind up being splattered on the wall instead of walking through the wall. So, so anyway, we'll just kind of disconnect right here and we're going to pick up on this theme some more because Him, mm -hmm. really, when we get a better understanding of Him, we realize Him is in, especially in Egyptian mythology, we start to see it more and more and more. And it will, you know, it'll really, I think, ring clear to us. Okay? Alright. All right. You know, when they took the uh, uh, Bible in that and they made it literal how intelligent they were to be able to take the Christos, the life-giving mm -hmm. anointing, mm -hmm. and make it into uh, just a natural mm -hmm. thing of a one man they, they took the whole root of Christianity out of the Bible then. They took the yeah. whole, the, the anointing, the, the being able to do the supernatural, being able to be uh, God, uh, um, doing everything. They were so intelligent, mm -hmm. but they, they, turned it, they turned it into, uh, I mean, everything natural. They take in the spiritual out not allowing each person, little person, which we are a gigantic, they've, they've taken that all out, and this is 
this whole age. And how, how intelligent and uh, natural they were. Yeah, but you see, one, just one person did it. You have to think about this, what you just said. Think about this. And they didn't actually take it out, they hid it. So that most people won't see it. Because it's still there. As I use that illustration, it's like digging for gold. You've got to move a lot of dirt out of the way. You've got to, you've got to move a lot of additions, deletions, deletions out of the way to get it. But it's still there. It's still the truth. It's still there. It's hid, though. But you've got to take and think about this. We had a man by the name of Constantine who was one of the most powerful men in the world. And he set out to do this very thing. And so what he did is he took all of the bishops under what was at that, that moment one of the greatest moves on the earth as far as religion was concerned, and that was Gnosticism. Gnosticism for several hundred years, all the way back to the movement that began with the ASEAN communities who separated themselves, and they 300 years before understood the Christos. They even used the Christ in a lot of the ASEAN material 300 years before Jesus. So, Constantine gathered together three, somewhere close to 400 of the leading bishops or pastors or leaders of all over around the whole Middle Asia, world, Africa, uh, Rome, Greece. All, why? Because the Roman Empire was the, was the most powerful nation in the world. It ruled the world, basically, as we knew the world to be. It ruled it. And that one man that was the ruler of it was Constantine. And so he brought all of these bishops together and many of them protested what he was trying to do because what he was trying to do is exactly what you just said. He wanted to manipulate the scriptures and he wanted to come up with one government that would serve his political agenda. He wanted to come up with one religion that would serve his governmental political agenda. And that's what he did. And so those who would not comply to what he was trying to do, he killed them. So you go back and you read about all of the bishops who came and who were a part of that church, that he had the wealth of the world behind him, so power and money was no issue. He had it all. So he had all of that, so he took Scripture, he took the ancient Scriptures, and he, he did exactly what you just said. He twisted them, he manipulated them. He added to them. He hid the ph phenomenal truths so that it would be difficult for the common man or anybody to, to see it or to understand. Just but he didn't do it just in a, it didn't just happen at that one meeting. The seed of it was, was planted at that one meeting and it took them hundreds of years of manipulating this. They twisted this book and changed this book plumb on up in past, way past, past six and seven hundred. And they were still doing it. Then, then comes along Martin Luther and the Protestant movement and what did King James do? Go back and read the history of King James. You have the most powerful man uh, of the whole British English Empire, which was the largest, most powerful empire in the world at that time, that was pulling away from Rome. The Catholic Church. And what did King James do? He got together. How many did he get together to put this book together? I think he got 60 I think it was 50 or 60 priests or clergymen or preachers to come up with this. And they did this. They built this off of, off of quite a number of different translations. It's not, an, it's not an accurate rendition of these ancient truths, these ancient philosophies. The same thing is what Hitler was trying to do. So... Uh, it's, it's there. It, it, it's you know. It, it's in here. It's in. It's in this book. If we would just really dig into it. It just seems. It just seems utterly impossible how all the ministers and all the different places that I've been, you know, in, in my small little life, that how all the church world and our, the, us coming to the United States, coming to America, and everything, and to be separate from. You know the ruling of the king and the castes and everything. That we're such babies. We're such babies. Well, are ignorant. I mean, you know, I, I hate to say the word, but I so know so little. Knows, you know, it just doesn't it seem 
It just seems impossible. In this age of Aquarius and the computer and all that, we're, it, I don't think there's, and I'm talking about myself, uh, there's so many distractions uh, that we got our mind, I mean, I'm talking about myself now. I mean, got going all different ways that to take the time to do the investigation and everything. And that nobody is because we've got a zillion things to do. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, and that's so, true. And that, and it really takes a, uh, to be a hermit or, you know, I'm talking about that. I mean, when I. Uh, well, everybody has a different gifting. Everybody has. Everybody's. Everybody has something different to do. Yes, and it's all. And we can take something, you know, someone who's willing to, like an Alvin Boyd Coon, who gives his entire life to research and to study and to just pour his life into that. We can glean from these things, and we don't have to do the work that he did, which is a phenomenal thing. But the work we have is to put in practice that which we see, that we begin. That's another amazing thing about that movie, the Amish grace is uh, to practice what they did in that movie of forgiveness. And when you see that movie and you say, I do not know if I could do that. I don't know if I could practice that. I mean, that's what true forgiveness is. And even when you apply it to this watered down, twisted version of scripture, you still find it there. When uh, Even with Jesus, Jesus says, forgive those that persecute you or do all manner of evil against you. And we say, uh-uh. <laughs> you know, when it comes down to doing it, we might say, yeah, I read that and I know that. But what that's yeah. doing it, that's something different. You know? I'll forgive him, but he's going to pay. Amen. <laughs> well, that's the justice, that's the well, justice court. That's, that's the justice in the courts. I know. You get a justice Put him in jail and do it. He's done this and that, and there is the forgiveness. The, and and that. what we did with that was we didn't understand that it wasn't justice, it was really balance. <laughs> now, if somebody's out of balance, if something's out of balance, what are we going to try to do? Bring them back into balance. Is that justice? That's true justice. But to condemn somebody because they're guilty is not justice. No. Because who ain't guilty? Yeah. The people who are caught and found out, and people who are not. So, uh, but you know, hallelujah, I, I'm excited to be alive and just finding out what I'm finding out, you know. Uh, okay. I think it's, it's actually, exciting. It's, um, it's absolutely, My it's, a, it's like, a, I'm Rip Van Winkle, and then and I'm waking up. <laughs> <laughs> just this. And there's so much to wake up to. <laughs> wow.